Good morning, everyone, and welcome to The Key Points with me, Abna Tabi. Another Saturday is here, and we are here to look at matters of national interest. Indeed, it is a beautiful Saturday morning, a cold and drizzly one. We thank God for the showers of blessings. Indeed, the whole week, to a large extent, could be said to have been a rainy week. And along with these rains have come a lot of devastation, floods nearly everywhere. We extend our empathy to persons who were affected by the floods and we also hope that we come to a lasting solution regarding how we tackle the flooding situation in the capital of the country and indeed in other parts of the country as well. It is the Key Points, live on TV3, also live on 3FM 92.7. As usual, we're running from now till 9.50, by which time we'd have done justice to the topics we've outlined for today's conversation. Our WhatsApp line is 020-2166633. Activated now, so you can send through your comments, your reactions to the topics we'll be discussing, and we will share them as we go along on the show. Today on the show, we shall be looking at the Electoral Commission and the apparent tension between the Electoral Commission and uh, the main opposition party, NDC. Now, you don't need to be an ardent follower of the local news to know that there is some seeming tension between the opposition, NDC, and the Electoral Commission. Though it may be newsworthy, truth of the matter is this really is not a new development. Now, since the inception of multi-party democracy in 1992, there has been a constant battle between the major opposition party at any given time and the Electoral Commission. The irony, however, is that the moment that opposition party wins power and takes over the business of government, their position on the Electoral Commission switches and they become uh, the defender of the Electoral Commission, while the new opposition party, who not too long ago was also the defender of the Electoral Commission, then becomes uh, the number one critic of the Electoral Commission. I mean, you can cast, cast your mind back to the days of Dr. Akwejo Afarijan uh, between 1992 to 2000, for instance, where uh, the Electoral Commission appeared to be the darling boy of the NDC. Then there was a change in power come 2001, and we saw the reaction from the other side between 2001 and obviously to 2009. Now we are asking questions. Why is it that we seem to have this, you know, switching situations regarding an institution set up by the Constitution to be an impartial entity, yet we have these flip-flops all the time or once there is a change in government. We will be tackling this issue on the show this morning to understand exactly what it is about the Electoral Commission that seems to, you know, rub opposition parties the wrong way. Then we turn our attention to the Vigilantism and Related Offences Bill 2019. That has also been on the front burner this week. And in Parliament, um, some controversy is brewing. The minority in Parliament are calling on the President to publish the ML Short Commission report as a precondition for the passage of the bill into law. Now, according to the minority, the content of the report, given its subject matter, will assist in an informed debate on the bill in Parliament. The government, however, says that it will not be rushed into publishing the ML Short Commission report, arguing that the president has up until six months to do so. The question, however, is, is the demand of the minority in parliament justified? Is the publication of the commission's report necessary for the debate on the vigilantism and related offenses bill? We shall interrogate this issue as well on the show. So these are the topics we've outlined for today's conversation. Stick and stay with us. We'll take a quick break. When we come back, I will introduce to you the panelists for today's conversation and we shall dig straight into the Electoral Commission issue, among others. See you after the break. Welcome back. This is The Key Points. We're live on TV3, also live on 3FM 92.7 and on our website at 3news.com, also on our Facebook page, TV3 Ghana. So, 
Um, I'll quickly introduce the panel for today's conversation. We have two of them seated. We are expecting one more, but quickly um, to my left, we have the Honorable Osei Bonsu Amwa. He is an MP, the MP for Equapem South constituency, and he is also the Deputy Minister for Local Government and Rural Development. And to my right, we have Nana Kwabna Brompa Mensa. He is a Senior Programs Officer and Team Leader local and urban governance and security sector governance uh, with the CDD Ghana. Good morning, Honorable. Good, Good morning, morning. Nana. It's good to have you. We're expecting you so um, Mr. Elvis Efiyankra um, to join us to represent the NDC. Also on the line, we'll be speaking to the General Secretary of the NDC, Mr. Johnson Isidun Ketia. But for now, we'll start with the two in studio. So we'll start off with the look at um, the apparent tension between the EC and the opposition NDC, the, the, the main opposition party, NDC. <coughs> and I would want to start with you, Nana, coming from civil society and CDD. You've obviously looked at the situation from afar and tried to. I'd want you to give me your perspective on what you see happening. Earlier on in the introduction, I, I, I pointed out that really what we are seeing play out between the main opposition party, NDC, and the EC is nothing new. You, would, you see these things occur with you know opposition parties in the EC, it seems as though there's that running battle all the time. And what's interesting is when this opposition party gains power and goes into office, that complaint is not as much. You know, you don't hear them necessarily complaining about the processes of the EC. Well, uh, thank you very much. Uh, let me use this opportunity to say a very good thank you to people listening to us this morning. Uh, let me say. The Electoral Commission is but one of the institutions in the country uh, that we are all interested in. But the interest in the Electoral Commission is different <laughs> because of the vital role it plays in our democracy. Right. Um, uh, I will say elections uh, is the, the basic rock of democracy. And if one want to consider the tenets of democracy, is the first. If people commit human rights atrocities, there are ways of dealing with it. But if elections fail, the constitution itself is thrown overboard, and there are no ways of dealing with it. So that's where the interest comes up. Um, these issues have been there because of uh, uh, deepened interest in, 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 in the elections, and it's also because um, of the way elections play out in, in, in the country. Uh, yes, it was there, as you said, uh, during Dr. Farijan's era, mm -hmm. but it was not as intense as uh, when you compare Charlotte's era to that of Jean Mensa and Dr. Farijan. Mm -hmm. It's all because of two basic principles. One, uh, being a commissioner, you derive your legitimacy from two bases. Mm -hmm. The first one is from the Constitution. Mm -hmm. uh, and when you read the Constitution, it says uh, there shall be uh, a commission with three commissioners and it shall be appointed by the president. So that's your first legitimacy. Mm -hmm. uh, the, constitution, the constitution makes it clear that it is the sole responsibility of the president acting on the advice of the Council of State to appoint uh, commissioners. Uh, and therefore, nobody will have to question the, the uh, appointment criteria because it's so clear. However, if you follow uh, Charlotte and uh, Jemen Sensera, CDD Ghana and Kodio did issue statements uh, pleading with the president to do a thorough consultation and also background check, at least even if consultations were not going to be held, there was the need to do a thorough background check to see who is going to hold such an important position. Right. Yeah, we did admit that it's the responsibility <coughs> of the president. That's the first legitimacy. So when you come to power and you have <coughs> a legitimacy with the basic supports, then you know your administration is going to be better, that you don't have control over it. But a second aspect of your legitimacy that you have to do in attract it by yourself, that is through your administration. How you attract the confidence, the trust, and the support of general people, especially the major stakeholders are in the electoral process is the second aspect of your legitimacy. Yeah. This is where mostly the question comes about. I will say that the first one you don't have control because somebody will have to appoint you. But it's up to you, the commission members or the commissioner, to be able to act in such a way that you attract the second legitimacy that you so deserve mm -hmm. to make your uh, administration a success. So mm -hmm. that, that has been the problem mm -hmm. uh, so far. So my initial comment is that, yes, the appointment has been done. And, and uh, as, as soon as the appointment was done, there were some uh, misgivings from certain sessions of the population. Mm -hmm. 
and uh, barely two years into the administration of the commission members, we are also seeing some uh, sort of uh, problems uh -huh. uh, coming up with the administration. I was fortunate to have served under uh, Mr. Farijan and uh, Mr. Kanga as a Kodio Secretary of Staff uh, when they were there. In fact, <coughs> any time there were issues that you go to Mr. Kanga to report, the first thing that he says is that, oh, don't worry, Nana, it shall be solved at the iPad platform. Mm. Mr. Kanga had so much confidence in the iPad platform that he thought any report that was generated by Kodio that had a, a, some, of, some form of misgiving by political parties, he believed the iPad platform could solve it. it. So I believe that should be the modern we should go and all these things should be solved. Right. You talked about the, 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 the two forms or the two bases and from which uh, the, the commissioner derives, you know, his or her legitimacy. You talk of obviously the constitution making provision for the appointment. And then you talk about the administration. Are the two removed from each other? Don't you think how the administration of the commissioner goes depends on the circumstances under which they are appointed or how they come into office? The, the commission works with stakeholders and major stakeholders for that matter are, 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 are part of the commission. That's why I ended by pointing out the, uh, the IPAC platform. The commission will have to work, even if the first legitimacy question was not answered well. Mm. You, the president will have to appoint. You've come to power. Some misgivings, <coughs> some people who did not trust that you were going to perform well, it's up to you to prove them wrong. Okay. So you have to act in such a way that you attract and absorb your second legitimacy. Mm. And that is not done by the commission alone. I always say that you work with people. So the people themselves might also contribute to your legitimacy. You have to criticize by criticizing to facts and evidence. You have to support the commission to have that legitimacy because one of the key points of elections and why election results will be admitted, accepted or not, depends on the trust and confidence right. people have in the commission. Right, very well. Thank you. Um, let me quickly announce that we have um, Mr. Elvis Ifuyankra joining us now. He is the Director of Elections with the National Democratic Congress, NDC, but also uh, is a former Deputy Minister for Local Government and Rural Development and also a Minister for um, Youth and Sports in, 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 during previous administrations. So you're welcome. Honourable, you um, well, I'll come to you. Um, Nana raised some issues about the legitimacy, and in, in his submissions, he, he tried to you know, distinguish between the era of Dr. Kwejwa Farijan and what we've seen in recent times between Doc, uh, Mrs. Um, Charlotte Ose and uh, Dr. Jean Mensah. I mean, if you're looking at um, Dr. Kwejwa Farijan, he was commissioner during the, 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 the tenure of, you know, NPP, NDC, so yes, even though there may be suspicions at some point in time, depending on which government was in power, he was there at some point to superintend over elections during, you know, those periods. But when you're looking at um, the era of um, Madame Charlotte Osei, for instance, she came in at a time when, or she was appointed by the NDC, and she superintended over an election which saw the exit of the NDC. Yeah. If, even though... Prior to those elections, there was there was there was so much or so many allegations of you know attempts to rig the election in favor of the government and what have you. Then comes in Dr. Jean Mensah, appointed by this government. So how how are we to make you know the two if you like different situations? What what <coughs> what what should what does that speak to? What do we how what what can we make out of that? Well, th thank you so much, and good morning to fellow panelists and you, and to our viewers and listeners on radio, I understand. Well, if you want to talk about the Electoral Commission, you have to go back a bit, in the sense that the Constitution has provided under Article 43, the Electoral Commission, and then under Article 45, its functions. For for us to put it in the right perspective, we should also understand that even before the Constitution was um, promulgated, there was an interim national electoral commission which took us to elections in 1992, so, right. before the Constitution came into effect in 1993. Uh. And right from the beginning, there were problems. What I want us to look at is individuals who make personal statements about um, members of the commission, including the chair, and 
positions of parties when it comes to dealing with the Electoral Commission. And for us as the MPP, we remember very well that in 1992, when the Constitution provided that we could do the presidential elections first before the parliamentary elections, after the presidential elections, we had so many problems with the EC that we even had to boycott the parliamentary, parliamentary elections. Yeah. And what did we do? We eventually we ended up writing the stolen verdict. And in writing the stolen verdict, we were able to bring out all the major issues which we thought were wrong with the conduct of the elections. And through that, and through persistence, and even uh, bringing on board the international community, we started seeing reforms at the EC, <laughs> from opaque ballot box to transparent ballot box, to how we even voted. All those things came in. And through agitation, etc., reforms came to the EC. To the extent that we even ended up with IPAC, where we are supposed to be advisory to the EC, um, an advisory committee to the EC. Now, in your intro, you said that when parties are in opposition, they take on the EC. When parties are in power, they become spokespersons for the EC. Defenders, as it were. Defenders, I mean, they, 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 they seem not to have any issue with the procedures, and I well, think that is a fact. Well, you, you may have a point, but as we speak now, we cannot say that we're speaking for the EC. And then we've, we've, in fact, we've refrained from giving any impression that we are spokespersons for the EC. Indeed, sometimes our, our friends, our opponents, especially the NDC, try to draw us in, but we still check ourselves not to sound like we're speaking for the EC, because we have a reason for doing that. For us in MPP, as I said, the party position has always been where we have major problems with the AC. And we've been going to court even on some of these things. And if we talk about Dr. Afrejan doing his error, we had several issues with the, um, the uh -huh. AC. To the extent that in 2012, we went to court sure. on election petition. So we think that is our right. We think that, should, that is how democracy should work. What we really don't appreciate is where individuals will take on individual members of the commission and then malign them or bastardize them without any basis. That is not the official party position. But you, sometimes you have members of the party behaving that way and sometimes you really have to let them know that that is not the way to go. But going forward, I believe that as far as I'm concerned, we have worked very well. Even as parties, we've worked very well with the EC. But Ferdinand had his own problems, had his own issues. But I can tell you an authority that I've been part of um, IPAC for almost 10 years. Mm. And at every point when we go to IPAC, the minutes will show that there's a lot that we contribute to make the EC have their work very smoothly and easily. To the extent that some of us even in opposition, because we had a privileged position of chairing the Substitutional Legislation Committee. Every CI of the EC, we took major interest and part in shaping it and bringing them to Parliament to be passed. What has happened between the immediate past um, <coughs> EC administration and now, and how we have maybe engage them, of course, need to be interrogated. For the MPP, our major issue, with Charlotte to say, was about the register. Mm. And we, we, we expressed our concerns. We did everything that could be done. Eventually, some persons went to court, and we supported them. And the court ended up siding with us mm. about the, how the registration was conducted and about the fact that um, we could not use National Health Insurance Card to be able to register persons because that could not determine the citizenship of such persons. So we've gone through that. At the but, end of but the day... Even looking at, we'll be looking at yeah. um, the issues yeah. as you talked about the NPP's position or yeah. the issue mainly um, in the period leading up to the 2016 elections yeah. having to do with, yeah. with the voters register, which according to yeah. the party was over bloated. Yeah. Yes, we'll be looking at that as against what the NDC is looking at now yeah. regarding you know, whatever issue they have. We'll yeah. be looking at that now. But still on the question of how the opposition 
you know, reacts or deals with mm -hmm. the commission, or if you like, the commissioners. Yeah. For instance, with Madame Charlotte Osei, yeah. when she was appointed, we, you know, there was this hue and cry about, you know, even why Madame Charlotte Osei, there were several allegations thrown about here and there. I'm asking this question because I, I'm, I'm thinking definitely that cannot be lost on us, that how or the circumstances under which appointments well, are made could also affect. Yes, well, we should appreciate the fact that the, our constitution has it's been fashioned, which has not been amended, requires the president to go through a certain process to appoint members of the commission mm -hmm. to the extent that he has to take it through council of state. He doesn't come to parliament for vetting. Such persons are appointed. And indeed, when Madame Charlotte Say was appointed, the seven member commission had five members who had been appointed by the NDC and two members who had been appointed during the era of the MPP. But we had to live with it because that was the situation. Agrifin and um, Pauline Jajawa were appointed during President the first time. Professor Domo, who had been appointed, had retired. So when there were vacancies, when um, Kanga retired and Amadou Sule was pushed up, and then when Afrejan left and got, um, Charlotte was brought in, the seven member commission had five members who had been appointed by NDC and two by the MPP. But I think that that wasn't a problem. And indeed, when Charlotte was appointed, I don't think we made noise about her appointment or her background because some of us, we knew Charlotte very well from way back from law school. And some even thought that she had friends in the MPP than even in NDC. But neither here nor there. The president, some. People were lobbying that those internally, like Sule and Opoku Amangwa, should rather be mm. chaired and shallow. But at the end of the day, it was 5-2, as you put mm. it, on the panel. Mm. We worked with them. And if we all think that we should change the constitution the way such persons are appointed, even Constitution Review Commission, they both said some ideas as mm. to how we should appoint them. Even you have persons saying that, no, they should even have a term of office. It should not be so they retire, right. but this is, if it's 10 years, they serve, or two terms cycle, yeah. they serve their term and move on. There are all sorts of ideas as to how we should put them there. But because that's how the Constitution is, in the era of a president, he will end up appointing the Chief Justice, IGP, yeah. the Trial Commission, independent bodies who will be appointed by the president. The fact that we've put a person there, especially when the person has... Um, security of tenor, uh, the, nobody can interfere in the work they do. The assumption is that we, we, we are secured. Right. And that's how I want us to see it. Very well. Let, let, me, let me come to um, Mr. Fiyankwa here for your perspective. What we're looking at generally, before we even delve into the nuances of, mm. you know, the recent issues, we are trying to understand why it is that, you know, the Electoral Commission, an entity or uh, uh, an institution set up or guaranteed, mm. established by the, the Constitution, supposed to be impartial, you know, appears, you know, to, um, depending on which government is in office, this opposition, if, if, if a ruling party, a ruling party may not necessarily find issue with the processes of, of the EC, but then when it goes into opposition quickly, we see the, 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 the you know, some seeming tension play out. That is a fact. I mean, we, we can, you know, give examples. And I'm just trying to understand why it is the way it is. And how we can, you know, in trying to resolve matters, see how best we can deal with that situation, which is why we're looking at perhaps is it an issue about how the appointments are made, you know, and those circumstances, do they raise issues with how the person <coughs> named and appointed goes on with their administration? Well, I think that um, on one hand you have uh, perceptual issues, mm -hmm. and perceptions are, they become real, they have to be dealt with. So if you have a situation where if parties in opposition uh, seem to be uncomfortable with uh, uh, electoral commissions and the records will show that when the MPP were in power, they were even more vociferous than us. They haven't done, uh, we haven't done one tenth or one hundredth of what they did uh, when they were in opposition. So that fact is there. I think that going forward, we have to look at perhaps the way the appointments are done, mm. you probably have to consider that. But the fact still remains that every party, whether in government or opposition, has a right to be vigilant 
and alert when it comes to matters of election. And it all starts with the Electoral Commission. And so uh, there are so many ways of doing that. <coughs> uh, you can go to court, and the MPP did a lot of that. Uh, the records will show that they went to court many more times than we ever did on electoral issues. But uh, it's better to go to court than resort to other, you know, exactly. means, and right? It's, right. it's okay. Yeah. And, you know, uh, there's a case in courts now on the current. Sure. I'm sure we're going to deal with yep. that, which we support. Um, agitation, lobbying, advocacy. So these are legitimate tools that every party can use mm. whenever they feel that there are issues to be dealt with. I think beyond the generalization and the perception mm -hmm. we need to look at the issues on its merits right. whether or not the issues that are being raised by the parties are factual there's a basis for it and indeed within the context of whatever is going on they are relevant for me that is more important mm -hmm. because otherwise there's a tendency to generalize oh parties when they are in government they support the electoral commission then when they come to opposition then they turn around that is a general statement that doesn't do any critical analysis of the issues. What we should be concerned about is that at any time that parties in government or opposition raise issues about electoral commission or electoral, electoral related issues, are the issues they are raising relevant? Are they factual? Are they germane? That should be the basis. And I'm sure that we'll have time to go right. into the issues. And when we go into the issues, you realize that we do not have any problem whatsoever with Madame Charlotte uh, Jimensa or the commissioners. They have been appointed. That is what the Constitution says. We don't have any problem with that. We don't have any personal antipathy towards them. But we are raising genuine, legitimate issues. But isn't and it the case that I mean, what it, what 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 is genuine, what is legitimate, what is germane, really is left to the interpretation of you know. Sometimes it's you would expect people to see this as well. These are valid or legitimate issues. But then they'll be like, it, well, it, it depends say, on who is I have, raising I have, them. I have, I have observed that because electoral issues are a bit technical. So it takes time mm. for people to really appreciate. You know, you need to go beyond all the noise, you know. And there's also a very intelligent attempt by um, those who are on the other side to make it look like, oh, it's the usual noise. But if you take your time, and I'm going to demonstrate with facts and figures to show that there are genuine legitimate issues. I think that is, we should focus on mm. the issues. Uh, is there merit in the issue? Is there what is the historical antecedent is what has been happening in the past and what is being done and what will be the impact and the effect i think those should be the issues rather than saying oh uh, is, is the normal no it's not normal there are legitimate issues that we are raising and we'll look at each one of them on its own merit mm. very well so currently the ndc has taken issue with you know a number uh, of the the processes we have, mm -hmm. that they have run to court whether we like it or not. And it's Dominic Gaini who is defending the plaintiff. Mm -hmm. And he said that they support them. So we should be cautious in not oh, discussing we the matter here. Not, yes, yes. To the, well, well, we would try not to, yes. Mm -hmm. But to the extent that, of course, we do know that if it bothers on mm -hmm. public interest issues, exactly. we can, yes. But, so, mm -hmm. but, but, but definitely we would exercise mm -hmm. caution and circumspection here in regards to... These are you know, matters of to, public mm -hmm. interest and we will discuss them. We are not dead. But yes, we wouldn't do anything that would be prejudicial, exactly. obviously. We not do to that so That's what is I, to guide us. Yeah. So, can, please. so can I go on? So... Before I do that, um, let me deal with the posturing of the current EC, because that... I was, I was, I was going to ask a question okay. when the um, Honorable mm. Obi um, you know, made that input. I was saying you ended on the, on the point that what should guide the discussion should mm. be whether or not the issues raised are genuine, are mm. sincere, and all of that. So I just want to know exactly what the NDC's issue okay. is. Okay. And you, you, you carry on with that. So you're bringing in the posture. Yes, the sure. posture. So um, the EC is appointed, first IPAC meeting. Uh, they were going to discuss the limited registration in the 47 districts where they were going to hold a referendum. Mm. And we had 46 minutes notice. And uh, we knew that all the other parties, political parties, civil society groups, mm. had 
adequate notice a few days some a week which is a normal practice we usually get our notices about a week or so before so we can prepare we had 46 minutes notice and uh, we protested of course we couldn't attend that meeting so the subsequent meeting we said uh, because we're not represented and we are a major stakeholder can you table the issues again so we can discuss them the EC refused and that was when they were going to do the limited register uh, registration in the 47 districts and that was the first time they did the registration using the VMS equipment in their district offices then we went for the second meeting and at that second meeting there were three items on the agenda that one you had sufficient notice yes we had sufficient notice okay. there were three items on the agenda limited registration inspection of political mm. party offices and then audit reports and we had elaborate discussions about three and a half hour meeting and then in with the ec said we're going to do the limited registration using the district offices again when they did that the first time they had a target of 100,000 people and they had 47 percent so we said that system will not give you enough turnout so use that the electoral areas and in her explanation she said next year uh, we intend to create a new register because the old equipment is out of use etc so she's just spent like a minute explaining and we came back to the issue we said no we think that you should use the electoral areas for the limited <coughs> registration mm -hmm. and even uh, the MPP said they should even go back to the polling stations some said constituency and we closed the meeting we went home by 9 p.m. there was a press statement from the EC stating that after extensive deliberations all the political parties agreed one it talked about the limited registration two then it talked about something that was totally strange that we all agreed that there will be a new biometric register in 2020. So it was like getting calls. I was at the meeting. Mm. We did not discuss new biometric register. It was not on the agenda. It was not discussed extensively and exhaustively because that was the prefix to the rest of the statement. It means that it was put on the agenda. Everybody discussed it. You listened to divergent views. And issues about biometric register are very, very serious issues. The whole credibility of the election depends on the credibility of the register. Mm. So if such a very critical issue, which will not even be discussed, cannot be discussed at one IPAC meeting, usually it takes a series of stakeholder consultations, civil society, media engagement, and all that. Vendors will come and do presentations. We haven't done all that. And you come out and tell the public. Then you, you give us cause to be suspicious. What is the agenda? Why do you want to smuggle in something that was not on the agenda? So that is where we started having, you know, challenges. One, a meeting, we were called very late, they discussed something, they implemented it. Two, something that did not happen, they, they tried to push it. Okay. So at, sub at subsequent meetings, we raised issues again about the uh, uh, limited registration and the fact that the methodology they want to adopt would disenfranchise uh, millions of potential voters. In one of the discussions, the General Secretary then asked, the chairperson, um, have you not gone to parliament to ask for uh, a budgetary approval to repair the old equipment that you say are outmoded? And you know her answer? We, I do not, we do not owe the political parties an explanation. I was there and I was dumbfounded. I was, I was like, what is going on here? So I I started lecturing. I said, look, madam, I teach communications, body language. Your position is so sensitive that certain things that you do or say can plunge this nation into chaos. And of course, when I started, and then I also became heated. So everybody was laughing at me that your body language is not good. And I said, I'm very you're passionate. Speaking of body language, yet you're not. <laughs> exactly. You know, I said, no, I'm very, very passionate because these are serious, but you cannot say that. So then she went on to explain that the old equipment is like a portmanteau, and so the general secretary started laughing, you know, and everybody was chuckling here and there. That is the why is the general secretary laughing. So you see, then uh, uh, when the first meeting we were giving short okay. notice and we we're raising issues, then the deputy commissioner came out and said, uh, if the NDC continues in that way, then the EC will no longer supervise their internal elections. He said it publicly. 
Now, this is something that is in the Constitution. The EC is bound by law to supervise the internal elections of every political party. So if a deputy commissioner out of anger would just say something like that, what signal are you giving? Then beyond that, when we continue to raise the issues, she came out and said that um, the NDC is a threat to our democracy. That was the limit. Very well. How, uh, how, okay, how can uh, you, yes. a, a deputy commissioner, make such a statement? And then on several occasions, I have been on panels with him, on several occasions, he has said that, well, the IPAC is not, you know, they cannot be pushed around <laughs> by political parties, they cannot be pushed around by... Very so, well, Ms. this Yager. kind of attitude okay. and posturing so you've, you've painted, creates you've a given problem us ab initio. A certain, you know, picture yeah. of what is informing your position that the posture of the EC Before is... Before we come and deal with we, the we will go, Yes, but as facts. you said, there's a checklist we're using against mm -hmm. this to determine yeah. the merits or otherwise of yeah. this, which is, is it factual? Mm -hmm. Is it um, legitimate and mm -hmm. also mm -hmm. as to whether or not it's factual. Mm -hmm. yeah. Miss Honorable will be you in the meeting as well. No, he, he's, okay. not, he's not been in all the meetings. Not you also <laughs> haven't been in all the meetings. <laughs> Only one. Well, I mean, I'm going to show you, so to show you meeting. let, let, meetings that you were not in <laughs> and where the posturing started. Mm. You have been in all meetings. Yes. One, in as much as I yes. don't want us to be, you know, split heads yes. on certain issues because there are, yes. there are lots of issues so we need to look at. The issue yes. I'm raising. Let, yes, you raised a number of issues. Oh, I'm not easy to respond to. He's raised the issue about 46 minutes. Then, Just a minute. He's raised issues about the timing of exactly. certain notices mm. to them. Mm. The first meeting, he says, they were given 46 minutes mm. notice. Then the second one, he says, well, yeah. they were given adequate notice. So perhaps the EC learned from, if indeed the 46 minutes notice is the case, then it learned they from that. Public and then yes, did, yes. Okay. But the question about the decision on the biometric voters register, for instance, I just want us to look at that yes. within the context of how decisions at IPAC are made. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Um, if you want to really look at this issue and look at it very well, we have to start from the beginning. These are human beings who are running an institution supposed to be independent. Of course, once you have agreed to be in public office, you should have thick skin. But we should also appreciate that sometimes when people get personal, people are bound to also hit back. We all know that Madam Charlotte and her two deputies appeared before a committee of the Chief Justice and they gave evidence against each other. At the end of the day, the committee found them not to be suitable to run the electoral commission. When they left, they said the president had chased these people out and that the president was bringing his team in to be able to help him win elections. Obviously, the person coming in, that's a posture that you have started giving. The first meeting, which I said that he wasn't there, was a discussion of Ayala Suez were going by election. And at that meeting, the NDC was represented by Bid Zidin. A decision was taken on the date. And even the AC said they were taking that date because the NDC was going for their presidential primaries. We could have complained that why, if NDC is going for presidential primaries, why should we, that affect statutory date? At the end of the day, we all agreed. Indeed, some of us saw Bid walking out to consult. He came back, he agreed, and even for the EC to be very certain that we had all agreed, a statement was issued that they said the party should sign, which the NEC signed. Two days after, they were sitting on radio attacking the EC for giving that date. Two days after, they lambasted the EC for giving that date. Eventually, they even, they even went to court on that matter. And that was pre I was by election. And that's how it started. Then we had the by elections. After the by elections, he didn't turn up. I'm just giving him what had happened that he was <coughs> not present. After the by election, the IPAC meeting, the NDC was so hostile. The chairman of the NDC of Fusan Bofu personally took on the EC chair and the others. That why should they give a report that the IRA by election was free and fair? And that didn't they see what happened at La Baulechi? How can they? And he insisted that we are not in charge of security. As far as we are concerned, it happened that even near one police station, the rest of the police stations, we didn't have any report of any problem. Some of us jumped in and said that you are talking about free and fair elections. You, your party, sat on air and said that the EC had voted the register for IRSO West Wagon elections. For the EC to come out 
to even deny it. When they deny it, you couldn't prove anything. Secondly, elements of your party, including your deputy general secretary, you were on record as saying that the issue was helping the MPP to win the elections and that ballot papers had even been found near Jimpa. And the ballot papers were shown all over the place. Thankfully, the bag containing the ballot papers had the label Laura. Number two, the ballot papers had the old EC logo. Otherwise, you can imagine what would have happened. And you were accusing the AC of trying to unblock the register to helping the MPP to rig yeah, so by election. So I said they should put all those on record. They shouldn't <laughs> just come and complain about, about AC. That is how the so-called posture was building. And the posture cannot be from only one side. The posturing was from both sides. Three, we have said that I passed several times that ideally, when the, this issue of <coughs> um, limited registration came in, mind you, even before they called IPAC, they had appeared before the Special Budget Committee in Parliament, where all the parties are represented. And then they had submitted their report that because of these circumstances, this is how we want to go about it. The minority leader, Haruna Idrisu, is a member of the Special Budget Committee. He had other members who interrogated the EC very well about this matter. Which matter, please? About the registration matter. I have, I have the document. I was there. I have it. Uh, yes. And I'll prove that you're not telling the truth. <laughs> no, you I let me finish. No, no, I'll come Let to me you. finish. You and will prove. be no. there. No, let me finish. Yes, I, let I, I'm, prove I'm saving it. you for. Yes. Let me finish and let him prove it. Uh -huh. He came to IPAC. Uh, I said IPAC, sorry. Special yeah, budget. Yeah. This is not a document about special budget, so don't worry yourself. So I don't go the special budget. They came to the special budget with their timetable for the registration and then talked about limited registration, exhibition, nomination, and the election date and the referendum date. Some of us even complained that the date, they were talking about December, and we said the date was too far away because the, election, the assemblies will have their tenure ending in September. We explained why they had to go that way, the problem of the kit, if they have to, indeed, if they have to um, go the full hog, how much they were going to spend, and the implications of that expenditure, mm. and the fact that they thought because the following year, that is next year, they will do a doing register, they should stick to the limited register and spend quite less so that come next year, they'll do a new register. They said all this at Special Budget Committee. I was there, not that it's hearsay. I was sitting, minority leader was there, majority leader was there, chairman and ranking, they were all there. And all the parties represented in parliament, we were on that committee, we, we heard everything. Mm -hmm. That is when they had finished that they came to IPAC and came to narrate this. I, I concede that because I heard so much at the Special Budget Meeting, there were some things that they could still have said at IPAC for everybody to know that they were not hiding anything or concealing anything. If indeed they did not give the full details they had to give, probably I was in a privileged position. I had heard everything. And the assumption too is that because the parties are represented at the special budget, the, the parties will have, will have had enough briefing. But that is... The, the problem of the AC is not a problem for us or anything. Now, so going forward, the impression being created where even the... the so, 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 so you're saying that the issues you're raising are not factual? And they, no, they, 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 it's not no, le no, legit? No, I haven't been come there. What, I, what we said at IPAC, which are in the minutes, was that ideally we would have loved you to do this whole thing at the polling station. Mm -hmm. We said it at IPAC. This is the minutes. I made that statement. Ideally. Because, one, it's easier for us as parties because we drive people to go and register. Two, it's more convenient, it's cheaper. But it's capital those intensive things. and they don't have the requisite yes, financing all those for things. that. But if you are saying that these are your reasons why you cannot do registration at the police station center, then we have to take some concerns into consideration. Mm -hmm. First, when, it, when the registration is at the district level, so many people, you cannot handle them. Even some have to that, travel yeah. very far. 
All those things, we, we made it. That's fine. And so the issue about the dis whether to do um, the registration at the district level, electoral level, or even polling station level, is an issue that is being... Um, which, which we is, also... Is, which is we a very, raised. It's, it's a bone of contention. Raised. Yes, but It we, continues to be. Yes, uh, but we have given them... We are saying that what the EC is doing is not favoring anybody. Mm. The person is being created that is what you see is doing will favor anybody. Very well. I would want you it's to at, look at the, the, the decision about the biometric metric register, which, according to uh, Mr. Fie here, wasn't tabled for discussion, but in a communique that was subsequently published, the EC indicated or stated categorically that yes. all sides, all the parties I, had I agreed. Agree. What, yes. I agree that it, if it's any other matter, if it's any other business, and it will be discussed later. But you say it in passing. That I want to do limited registration because next year I want to do a new register. Then you don't issue a communicator that creates the impression that the parties have discussed mm -hmm. and agreed. I agreed. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm not here to speak for the EC. I agree to that. So if they have a problem with the EC by stating but that. Later on, the EC even apologized for that mishap. It's between them. Even the so-called 46 uh, minutes invitation. We also had very short notice. But we decided to go. And it even asked them why the notice was too yeah. short. We admitted that they were then coming in. That was their first meeting. And indeed, the director of communication, Japasu, he should have known better because he had been with us. He, he was the one issuing notices. Very well. Honorable. You understand? So very well. So those things, we, we go there, we express our misgivings that you gave us very short notice, but we had to rush in because you had given us that notice. Our, <coughs> our friends decided that the notice was too short that they wouldn't turn up at all. Well, it's, 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 like, it's like, like, like the vice president said during the election petition, you and I were not there. I mean, I, I wasn't there. So clearly, I'm listening to no, the two of you. No, no, I'm just, <laughs> no, not at all. I'm just saying, I've heard from, or we've heard from the NDC, we've mm. heard from your side, the, 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 the discretion of the people is what I mean, we're looking at to make, you know, that judgment as yeah. to what exactly is happening but when we come back i will go to nana abrompa here for his perspectives after listening to the two sides speak exactly what the situation is we are trying to understand exactly what the seeming tension between the you know opposition ndc and the electoral commission is what is the basis for that we obviously need them to cooperate for 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 for, for better results in our democracy we'll take a break when we come back we dig deeper into these issues Uh, but not at that point. <laughs> Welcome back. Um, uh, this is the key point. We are live on TV3, also live on 3FM 92.7, and around the world at 3news.com, also on our Facebook page, TV3 Ghana. So we are looking at the Electoral Commission and its relations with uh, of the uh, political parties. But um, um, fundamentally, we're looking at it, the, the, the apparent tension between you know, the EC and the National Democratic Congress, the main opposition party in Ghana. <coughs> we've, had, we've heard from um, Mr. Elvis Ifri Ankara and also Honorable Obi Amwa, obviously two different positions regarding facts that are supposed to have, you know, played out at certain events or occasions, particularly looking at IPAC meetings, for instance, and all. So I'll be moving on next to um, uh, somebody from civil society, Nana, <laughs> Nana Brompa, who is also, you know, are actively watching that space to, to just make sense out of what, you know, is transpiring between <clears throat> key issues raised here. We're trying to even understand what the facts are, but that area in itself is murky. We need to obviously, like uh, Mr. Fiyankra said, you know, have this independently verified. Of course, we, that, that would help, you know, a great deal in moving forward. But as it is now, this is where we, we are at. I don't, I, I don't have much to add. Uh, that is to say, to ask whether the IPAC platform is indeed needed. If it's needed, um, then we need to take the issues as they unfold and see how we can uh, rework it, solve it, so as to become important and uh, it plays its role uh, as it's been playing over the years. That's sort of at part platform, as I will say, uh, is a, a decision shaper. The platform is a, a consensus building, and, and the platform itself was a troubleshooter. Uh, I, I said in my intro that uh, when any time CDD or Codio had our pre-election environment monitoring, there was reports that some political parties <laughs> were not uh, content. And we go to uh, uh, 
Mr. Kanga, he will say, oh, no, no, don't worry, we will solve it at iPad platform. He had so much confidence in the platform that he thought there wasn't anything difficult that couldn't have been solved on the platform. Mm. When we went to Liberia uh, to discuss, let's say, fortunately, Dr. Farijan was there. One of the key things that Liberian uh, Commission picked from us was the IPAC. In fact, they came to our hotel for us to brief them more, how civil society organization, uh, see the IPAC and how it works. And quickly they took it over from us. As I said, the constitution does not mandate uh, the Electoral Commission to discuss its uh, uh, activities with anybody. But the constitution says that organize the election in such a way that it becomes credible. The only thing that we can ensure credibility is, trans is through transparency, information sharing. And it's on the platform that these things are done. So uh, uh, it diffuses tension and it also clears ambiguities before even uh, activities are uh, unpacked to the public. So I believe uh, mm -hmm. some of these things, as uh, my good friend Elvis was uh, on laying the, the facts and the what uh, Honorable has mm -hmm. also said, I think they are not so much difficult issues that could not be solved. It's about human behavior. What the MDC sees as a wrong posture, probably the Electoral Commission also see it as a wrong posture from the NDC. How do we bridge the gap? So we'll build consensus and work forward. That's what should be done. Right. Now, in, in the spirit of building consensus and all, let's look at the thorny issue of, for instance, where to have limited registration exercises done. So um, the EC is saying, by reason of you know financial constraints, it's not able to do it as far and wide or do use the electoral areas, for instance, but it would rather use the district offices because that's how far it can go. And it raises issues about financial you know, issues, talking about the fact that, well, we don't have the funds. But the NDC in response says that Parliament approved you know, uh, the budget for that. That obviously is this, it's, it's either Parliament approved the sum needed for the job or it didn't. So there shouldn't be any you know, um, haggling over that, for instance. But here we are, we have the issue and we are splitting hairs over that. Is it the case that Parliament did approve the funds, for instance, and so the funds should be put to its use, which is then, let's do electoral areas, or that Parliament did not approve, and so we are having to do with what we have. That shouldn't be an issue that... Sure, sure, sure. So uh, when you, you follow the news, uh, CDD Ghana, uh, in his comments on, on the issue, uh, explained, and I think, let me put it on that, all stakeholders mm -hmm. did not agree initially to the proposal to hold uh, the, the registration the, the district, district, district offices. offices. In <laughs> fact, uh, Honorable Obiamo has just said the ND, MPPV went ahead exactly. to say they should do it at the polling station. The, uh, and, uh, so c uh, civil society organized. We came. In fact, I was. So that decision is not necessarily favoring, favoring anybody. anybody. In fact, we all disagreed. In fact, mm -hmm. in my comments on the issue, uh, uh, if you could check from the social media and other things, I just said, okay, over the years, we've been holding these. Uh, 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 registration in the electoral area so, so that uh, it's the reason for registration is to bring on board people exactly. who have don't have the right to vote because their names are not in the register how do we make it so open so closer to the people as honorable Obiamo said that people can come and register in fact uh, people with disability they are one of the people called me to vote well, they wanted to issue a statement mm. that they think their people in the villages cannot go there to go and register financial wise traveling wise they cannot go so what I did say was that, can the EC come out to tell us why uh, he can't organize it at the electoral areas mm -hmm. or the polling centers? So the explanation should ought to have been given at the IPAC. That's why I said I have so much trust and confidence in the platform that I think everything could be discussed there for people to get a real understanding. Mm -hmm. uh, so this, uh, the issues that they are raising, it was based on some of this discontent that uh, the electoral commission has come up to say that it's going to do additional registration difficult to reach areas and centers. I was thinking with well, this explanation that people will be content with mm -hmm. it and will go ahead with it. So I still believe that yes, issues come, issues go. There, there should be a common platform for us to get the explanation. I wasn't at the IPAC uh, a meeting, but I didn't see anything wrong if uh, Jen had gone ahead to explain whether the, the parliament approved mm -hmm. some uh, amount for them yeah, to do that. which is what we need to look uh, at. And then sure, now please hold on to sure. that. We have, um, I'll come back to you when we're done with this um, interview here. We have um, the General Secretary of the National Democratic Congress, NDC, on the line, Mr. Johnson Isidinkitia. Good morning, Mr. Isidinkitia. <clears throat> Good morning. Thank you for joining us. Hope you're doing well. You're welcome. 
Great. So we're looking at uh, the, you know, the recent developments regarding your party and, and the EC. We're trying to, you know, understand exactly what it is that is going on. What are your major grievances? Our grievances are that, one, you are organizing a limited registration exercise. And we know from statistical service that the people within the age group you intend to capture or who are qualified to be captured, <coughs> they number up to 1,752,000. And yet, according to your uh, planning, you, your target of uh, registrants is maximum 500,000. So it goes against the constitution of the Republic of Ghana that knowing that 1.7 million people qualify to vote, it is obligatory for the uh, Electoral Commission to register them. And yet, having these facts at your fingertips, you decide that you will be registering 500,000. So you are suppressing the, the rights of uh, 1.2 million Ghanaians who qualify to register. That is clearly against the yes. Mr. Mr. Senkutia, on that, on that issue, do, um, for instance, at your IPAC meetings or interactions with the EC, have they given a reason why they are going with that number? There can be no reason. The reasons they gave are unjustifiable. Number one, they said that, that the equipment they intend to use for the registration is the limiting factor. So they can only capture one point. Uh, well, they can only capture 500,000 out of the 1.7 million. Mm -hmm. And you ask them, it is the, 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 the decision of the commission to choose that type of equipment when the alternative equipment that could capture 1.7 is available within the commission. So if you decide that this equipment will be able to capture 1.7, but on our own, we have decided to use an alternative equipment that will capture 500,000. It means that you are intentionally denying uh, 1.2 million Ghanaians their right to register and vote. Then that is one. Mm. Then number two, <laughs> we have said that we, uh, 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 according to the law that govern the registration, that is PI 91, <laughs> this registration should be extended to places which are accessible to the people you want to register. And there's Stations that you declare or you designate as registration centers must be places which are suitable for use as polling stations in elections. Those two conditions have been violated because if you insist that you are going to register at district offices of the Electoral Commission, the district offices are not accessible to the people you want to register, all the people you want to register because they are accessible to people within the district capital. And then in the outlying areas within the district, people have difficulty accessing the district capital for registration purposes. And that is the reason why we have always been extending the registration to electoral areas. And then we also, uh, uh, the Electoral Commission to has not been very truthful about uh, uh, the, the, the whole program of registration. Today, they will tell you that we are going to high buses to bus everybody to the district capital for registration. Then, another day, they tell you that no, the decision to high buses wasn't the decision of the whole commission. It was one deputy uh, uh, chair of the commission who said it. So, uh, so we are not going to abide by that. Meanwhile, this is information that has been put in the public domain. And the public are entitled to believe the deputy chair of the electoral commission who speaks on behalf of the commission. Then again, the targeted population you intend to register, 
Two weeks earlier, you had indicated that your target was 300,000. Mm -hmm. Then two weeks after, you indicate that the target is uh, 500,000. Without any justification, as if the whole work at the commission is done by guesswork. When the statistical service is the authorized body to make pronouncements about population figures and those who qualify uh, within the 18-year group, you have refused persistently to take uh, information from statistical service, and you are relying on guesswork and de de determining who you want to register and who you don't want to register. Mr. Senikotia. Quickly, um, um, we need to wrap up here, but quickly, these are matters that clearly ought to be discussed or ought to have been discussed at IPAC. Is it the case that no consensus was reached at the IPAC meetings and so uh, the EC went ahead and did what it had to do or that um, this is going contrary to decisions reached at IPAC? Listen, my sister, the whole attitude of electoral commission to IPAC it's also ambivalent. When he sues them, they quote IPAC <laughs> consensus as a decision. When he doesn't sue them, they say that they have the right to take their decisions without IPAC input. So they should let Ghanaians know what their attitude is towards IPAC. Because they cannot be quoting IPAC uh, 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 as a decision maker on the one hand, and at some point they will be... They will be saying that IPAC is, uh, 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 cannot impose decisions on them. So that whole attitude towards IPAC is ambivalent. The mm. fact is that the IPAC cannot take decisions that will override the law. The Very well. position is the position that must, that must be upheld by both electoral commission and all the stakeholders. So if IPAC <coughs> decisions uh, conform to the law, then IPAC uh, and then Electoral Commission is doing something different, then IPAC decisions must be upheld. Mm. On the other hand, if Electoral Commission decisions are uh, 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 in accordance with the law, then IPAC cannot change. So we must always investigate what the position of the law is on any particular point. And that is what we have sought um, to do. Very well. I, I think we can end, end the conversation here. But thank you so much, um, Mr. Johnson Isidin Ketia, General Secretary of the NDC. I will turn to Nana here to wrap up on the submission. But um, Mr. Isidin Ketia raised some issues I would want to look at. I mean, you were raising the issue about IPAC sure. and its relevance sure. and how we can, you know, make it better for, for obvious reasons. So please, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. So I, I always hold a point that... Um, if there are issues and people clearly come out with their problems, it's, it's very easy to handle it. But where there are issues, then you can't be head and toe of the whole issue, mm -hmm. then it's not easy to. Now, uh, Mr. Esiodin Ketia and uh, Elvis have come up with cogent points. Whether they are factual or not, so it's another thing to be here because unfortunately. Yeah, facts easily verified. These are mm -hmm. facts in the yeah, public domain. Unfortunately, service, just for the record, no, no, no. <coughs> going to statistical service and they wrote back. So these are facts. Yes. Yeah. Unfortunately, uh, unlike previously, where Kodia CDD were invited to IPAC uh, meetings as observers, even though we don't have say to discuss, the last two meetings were not invited. So some of these things we are not privy to. But all that I say that so the last meeting Kodia was there, Mr. Oh, Hing. Mr. Hinke. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. So what are we saying that the IPAC platform is very relevant? Some of these issues should be sorted out there. What I'm saying now is. Uh, sort of mutual mistrust between Ex the and, and, and that has and always the, been the, the situation with the opposition. opposition. So but we yeah. need to work on that so we can make it <gasps> more relevant to sort decisions start before they come to public. Right. And uh, still on the issue of uh, well, um, honorable, uh, let me just um, put the question out there. You know, Mr. Sinikete is talking about the numbers, and um, Mr. Fianca says you, these are verified numbers from the statistical service. He's talking about the fact that the East is going to do um, register 500,000 as against 1.7 million. So, and, and the EC is saying, um, obviously, there are financial issues. It's not able to do all that. I just want to understand, should that then be, if there are financial issues... There should, are no financial issues, mm -hmm. and I'll prove it to you. Okay, so first of all, is evidence. it a financial issue or is it not? Well, 
you should be cautious in not giving a person that I speak for the EC. Definitely not. Oh, oh, yes. yes, please. Very, I don't. Very I so think there that, are some yes. questions that I just, okay, if you don't put it where to be like, I'm here representing the EC. You're not speaking. I don't represent the EC. But I, 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 I hope, the, I just want us to the, get, because see. One, let me come in here. One, we complain at IPAC that your decision to do it at the district offices. offices, yes. Very inconvenient, it will be expensive. People will travel very far. The EC initially gazetted these district centers. Then on 19th May, they did another gazette showing that apart from the district centers, they've added electoral areas okay. to it, trying to meet us halfway, more or less. But what they came to say before special budget, which I was referring to, was the fact that if they have to refurbish the present kit, they need about they need over fifty million dollars, and if that is only for the limited registration, when they intend to do a new register, and they give reasons why they intend to do a new register, then they think that it is not prudent to spend fifty-three or so million dollars within the twenty-one days for the limited registration exercise, knowing very well that they plan to do a new register based on what they came to state as the reasons why they have challenges with the present system mm -hmm. and the vendor. That is their excuse. Mm -hmm. That why do we spend $53 million to refurbish this kit for 21 days for those who have turned 18 or those who have never registered. And then come next year, because of the challenges that we have identified with the present system, we have to spend almost the same figure to have a new register. So we thought the limited registration thing will help. Initially, they brought the states, now they've brought electoral areas. We as a party, we've <coughs> looked at it. There are even some reactions from uh, districts and constituencies as to whether even the electoral areas that they've identified, whether they are convenient or they could do better. Yeah. That's right, but some of the issues, as I said, because <laughs> they are in court, we are not here to I mean, get into determine the matter that. here. But, but okay. Mr. Fuyankwa, the, the explanation given by the EC, looking at the refurbishment as against, you know, a new setting up or, you know, compiling a new register. And so trying to suggest then that let's carry on with this so that eventually when we do, you know, we go full scale with the new registration, then we can, you know, do um, closing the gaps as it were. Isn't that, isn't that tenable sorry, or justified? So, you see, th these are the things that even deepen the suspicion mm. and the mistrust. I'm sorry to say they're not telling the truth. This is the report of the Special Budget Committee on the 2019 Budget Estimates of the Electoral Commission, Parliament. And when I finish, I can give it to you. And page three, they talk about allocation of 373,444,112 mm -hmm. allocated to the Electoral Commission for its operational expenses in 2018. Mm -hmm. The amount was allocated to various expenditure items of the Commission as follows. Then it gives the breakdown. Now, in, in the EC's reports, okay, out of, it says page five, out of this appropriation, the Commission undertook past tense, mm -hmm. very key election-related activities, including successful conduct of limited voter registration exercise and voters regist register exhibition in 47 selected mm -hmm. districts in BA, North and Western, that they did for the referendum. So they did that. Trained 231 district officers in performance appraisal, appraisal in 15 mm -hmm. tax-related, enacted a constitutional instrument for the 2018 referendum. They did all that. So by logical consequence, if they say upgraded and maintained the voter management system across the country, they did that. Now listen, serviced and maintained the biometric voters registration, BVR equipment, biometric verification devices, BVDs, and data center of the commission. Mm -hmm. So they claim they have done all this. Well, it's here. But isn't that done annually? Hold, hold on, hold mm -hmm. on, hold on, hold on. What are those equipment for? What are those equipment? Those are the so-called portomanto equipment that she says is outdated. That cannot be used. The reason why, you see, there are three types of registration. We have the mass registration that is done every 10 mm -hmm. years. Then we have the limited registration that is done every two years. So in 2014, we did a limited registration. The target was 1 million. We scored over 80%. In 2015, 
In 2016, we did another limited registration. The target was 1.2 million. We got almost 1.1 million, almost 90%. Now, in 2018, <laughs> and all these were done in 6,000 electoral areas. In 2018, for the first time, when she did the limited registration using the district office equipment, and mind you, those equipment are not meant for mass registration. They came out of a 10 Adi case when somebody went to court when there was no registration going on, and then the EC could not register, mm -hmm. and the court ruled that provision should be made for every Ghanaian who wants to register mm -hmm. at any time. That's how come they got those equipment. So that is not the purpose of those equipment. It's for continuous registration. Mm -hmm. Now you use that in 2018, and you got 47% turnout. And you want to use the same thing for another limited registration in 2019. And we are telling you, you will still get 47% or mm -hmm. less. Mm -hmm. It's right. a simple matter. And then the general secretary Secretary has told us that statistically, mm -hmm. statistics it yes, is not but, good. But you, in, in, in countering that uh, argument, you're mm -hmm. making reference to this report. So, they have, so yes. the point I'm making is that they have serviced their equipment. Their equipment but that was in 2018. Yeah, of course. Now 2019. 2020 and 2019, mm -hmm. what's the difference? In so any case, hold on, hold on. Mm -hmm. Now we come to officials, this is page 9, officials from the EC informed the committee that the commission required the amount to upgrade its data center, acquire new BVR, in addition to 7,500 kits refurbished in 2016 and 5,000 new BVDs for the impending district level elections mm -hmm. scheduled for September next year and the referendum in 2019. So, the commission themselves says that they need equipment 7,500 mm -hmm. because they intended to do the registration at the electoral area level. Mm -hmm. it's like, have have it's, they gotten those equipments? But if they haven't gotten, they wrote, they this wrote was a request. It, they wrote the request, it has been approved. But and, and I'm asking, has it been given to them? Do they have the equipment? Uh, of course, they have a warrant. They've been given a warrant. You, you apply for money, the money has been approved, you've been given a warrant. So we are now going to raise questions about whether it's incompetence or negligence. It's here. I'm not, don't take my word for it. It's here in black and white. Mm -hmm. It says it very clearly. And then it goes on. The committee noted that the record commission requires an amount of 979 mm -hmm. million, almost a billion, to undertake critical election related activities for the conduct of referendum. The commission informed the committee that the amount will be used to procure BV and BVD kits, refurbish existing kits, upgrade the commission's data center, and undertake voter registration in preparation. The commission also applied part of its uh, funds for data to upgrade this data center, etc. So it is so clear that. Everything that the commission presented to parliament was based on the fact that they wanted to do this thing at the electoral area level. Mm -hmm. That and it was it's been approved. Warrants have been issued for them. So what is the problem? Quickly before I come to Nana, Miss Obiamo. Please, um, once people are listening to us, we should be also um, very cautious in putting out some figures. Sure. Indeed, if you open. Um, the, the process for registration and the turnout is 47 percent it doesn't That's mean you prevented easy. people mm -hmm. from not registering mm -hmm. there should be the difference the difference is where somebody comes to register and the person is not able, able to, to register because of impediments you've put in their way that's number one. But if you project, bad, 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 please, 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 no, please, please, no, 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 please, 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 from voting or registering. But doesn't an accessibility should, issue come in here? Yes. Because the race is traveling distances put in the and right all. Contest. I was referring to a document dated 26th March 2019. 26th March 2019 is post the document my colleague is referring to. This, I have, and even the comments which were made, I remember very well the managing leader saying that the AC should come and explain why they are allocated so much money but they don't appear to use their money mm. and then they come back with all sorts of things in appearing before the special budget committee for limit voter limited registration 26 march 2019 they, they answered all these things and to the extent that the the major issue that they brought across was the fact that we're going to spend so much this year for this limited exercise when we have given reasons here, challenges with the system and vendor, 
challenges to the system and vendor, challenges to the system. This, this is our document before the, uh, the reforms introduced, etc. Once we are going to do this next year, we don't think it's prudent to spend that kind of money for this exercise. That's it. That's what it, that mm -hmm. is what it said. And so, you said that, that document is dated March 2019. Yes. I have yes. it. I have it. Is and it? I'm sorry to say, is Honorable OB Amwa is deceiving the public. Show me you, where I'm deceiving <laughs> the public. I, I, show I, me I, where. Look, listen. Page by page. Show me where I'm deceiving the yes, public. Please. Okay. Show me what, where. Yeah, yes. Okay, so this is the same document. It's yes. not different. Mm -hmm. yes. It's the same document. Yes. So you cannot bamboozle So you carry on. What's your interpretation of it? Mm -hmm. Yes. This is it. In 2019, the EC will conduct one unit committee elections in 8,300 unit areas. Two. District Assembly elections in 8,300 electoral areas. Uh -huh. Referendum to decide whether to elect MMDCs uh -huh. on partisan lines in 16 regions. Uh -huh. Okay? So, all these are issues... If they you said they it, will, and yes. you are saying that... I just want us to have... Mm -hmm. the, you be on the same page. Mm -hmm. These are, as if you like, projections of what they are going to Very do. Very good. Doesn't necessarily you don't, mean you don't that read they it have in isolation. Sure. And doesn't I'm necessarily mean that they have the funds to and do have, it with. I have shown you evidence. It's not me. I've read for you where uh, they have you said told I was lying. the commission. Uh -huh. uh, and I have the that, you are holding. Hold on, hold on. Uh -huh. They've told the commission that in 2018 they repaired all the skits. Uh -huh. Okay. And because they want to hold the referendum yeah, in exactly. all these electoral areas. So because of that the money has been approved for them uh -huh. and they've been given a warrant. Now, the question that you should ask yourself is when the EC was writing to Parliament to say that they wanted to do the registration in electoral areas, did they not know that there were problems with the equipment? Was it an afterthought? So after you go to parliament, the sovereign par parliament of this republic, you go and present a budget, state that you want to do registration at the electoral area level. On that basis, because if you're doing it at the uh, district offices, the budget will be different. Mm. Because you're looking at 250 mm. offices versus 6,000 electoral areas. They even quoted 7,500. So well. the budget will be given to you based on that. So the, uh, the amount of paper you require, the amount of ink, the number of people, it cannot be the same. Let me bring, the in, the let me bring show, in the viewers and listeners as well. Show yeah, let me finish. Let me land. Can I land, please? We need to take a break. The amount of... Please, don't... I 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 that you want to do registration in 7,500 electoral areas. It is not the same as presenting a budget for 250 district offices. The amount of paper you require, the amount of ink, the amount of personnel you, you deploy. So you're look, reducing the number of electoral areas from 100% to less than 5%. Right, but so we need to interrogate use... what led to the switch and which is what we no, are still trying to here. discuss very well. But let me bring in our viewers and listeners at this point. Um, this one is coming in from Edwin in Achimota. He says, hi, Abna. Good morning to all your discussions. The switching strategy is not only with electoral commission, but with all government policies. Uh, this one comes in from Edem in Ho in the Volta region. He says, your program is educative. What worries me is the level of blind criticism many politicians engage in. Uh, they criticize just for their voice to be heard, perhaps for future appointments. Uh, they should know that people are now enlightened. So when they make these unguided criticisms, they dig their political graves, allow the government to work, and the electorates will decide. Um, this one also come in and says, this is Matthew in Adai, he says, Good morning to you. What at all is with the main opposition parties against the EC? The EC doesn't choose parties to rule the country. The people do. So they should rather go to the grassroots and serve the people who have been voting for them all these years and leave the EC to work. Um, <coughs> Honorable Maxwell Kofi Blagoji says, Mukaila Jones, Adia, uh, no, sorry. You're rather Mukaila Jonas, Adia. He said, from the look of things, I think... Uh, the NDC knows very well that they know they have no single chance in the upcoming elections. Okay, that's your opinion now. Williams and Kofredia says the banter between the EC and the NDC can be chalked up to the cloak and DACA and the Machiavellian way the EC chairperson was appointed. The EC commissioners um, think themselves at headmasters and the political parties as their students. Okay, now hack. Tiata in Wa says the less talked of the EC the better because um, the EC chair the better because she's more into confusing than okay I would not carry on with that because it's not in good taste. Good morning, madam. I think 
Um, the MPP has been economical with the truth about the former Easy Chairperson. Uh, Ms. Charlotte Osei says, is Mr. Amwa, Obi Amwa telling Ghanaians that the NPP did not accuse Ms. Charlotte Osei that she sold herself to get the EC chair? Uh, then the current chairperson was, was she not <laughs> seen sharing water at an NPP woman? Okay, all sorts of allegations coming in. That's Sowa in Teshi. Kwabna in Saperman says, I wonder why um, Jean Mensah is insisting that the limited registration in the district should be done in the district offices and not at the polling centers. This is going to deny many Ghanaian the opportunities to exercise their rights. I, she should come again. And Dokenu Jonathan in Akachi in the Volta region says, Good morning, TV3. Even an ordinary man on the street is highly worried of the posturing of these two figures at the, at the EC going into the 2020 elections. Looking at the take the EC boss when she was an I, he says, with IE and the man in which Madame Charlotte Osei was removed. So clearly issues raised about, you know, the going out of Madame Charlotte Osei and the coming in of Dr. Jean Mensah here. Lots of issues still need to be um, looked at. We'll take a break. When we come back, I go to uh, Nana Abrompa for his perspectives on, you know, all that has transpired so far between uh, the NPP and the NDC on the panel this morning. And we'll try to wrap up on the easy conversation. Then we're going to look at the vigilantism bill. See you shortly. Welcome back. So we are back to wrap up on the um, conversation looking specifically at the EC and all that is happening between the EC and the opposition NDC uh, regarding a whole lot of issues, but predominantly bordering on the limited registration exercise and where to have these um, exercise carried out. Um, Nana, I will come to you now and uh, just uh, your concluding remarks on this. I, I, you've heard them and all the issues that you have. I mean, you've suggested, you know, that the IPAC be reworked as it were, how it, 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 it does things to make it better, more vibrant, and be able to accommodate all these issues that are coming up. But there's another side of, of the commission which I wanted to look, to look at quickly, which has to do with the commissioner. I mean, there are those who are suggesting that perhaps the level or the frequency of media engagement should perhaps be reduced. Get, you know, somebody other than the commissioner herself, you know, at the forefront of these media encounters so that she's shielded, as it were, from all these, you know, back and forth. I would want you to give me your perspective on that as well. Right. So, um, now before I come to your yeah. listen, let me state emphatically that um, it's not because of uh, one's uh, level of education, one's beauty, or other special features that you pronounce somebody who has spent a lot of money as a loser in election than the fellow accepts it. It's because of a trust that is built into the system. It's because of the confidence that you have created at Azumi office. So it behoves on the electoral commissioners and the commission itself to try and maintain that trust. It's trust in election management body it's not created by the election management body alone. Mm -hmm. Major stakeholders of political parties can help build that trust. And that's why it's important to always uh, put issues into contests and do a tit a tit. So I will come. When we create the window out there, it creates room for attacks on the commission. And therefore, that's why sometimes there are temporary staff are attacked at the polling station and other things. It all begins from that. So we need to build that trust among ourselves and, and go ahead to do that. Um, coming to your uh, uh, substantive question, uh, I, I think uh, I would not have uh, much to say about uh, the electoral commissioner or the commissioners and their thing. It's all it boils down to how they carry themselves. I initially explained two forms of legitimacy. One is from the constitution. Whether she likes it or not, the president has appointed her. It's up to her to gain the other support and power from the populace. That you want it. You have to win it. Ask from your acts and, and the way you conduct yourself. The former EC had. Uh, Some people have said, for instance, Dr. Farijan never yeah. would hardly, you know, yeah. he would only come out when he has to. Yes, really, that's right. Uh, the has a PR, has a, a, a public relations officer. Mm -hmm. My own uh, government teacher at Accra Academy, Japasu, uh, was the, the, the PR. And uh, he issued a statement. I have had uh, occasion to question why. Uh, Bosman always endorses press releases. Where is the PR? I mean, sometimes uh, 
some of the things like go to the palace, things are said by the Ochiame mm. and not the, the main man himself. You only come out when it's pertinent for you to come out. If they can go back and the refurbish, reform, organize the apparel department so that the PR does some of these things, mm -hmm. the way a trained communicator will communicate okay. something, because you are under constant attack, as Honorable mm -hmm. Yamua said, you need to develop a thick skin. Uh, so you are under constant attack, and sometimes out of fear, because you are fearful, because you are angry, you may come out in a manner as to respond to certain accusations or insults on you, and that is not uh, good for the image of the Electoral Commission. So I believe they have to reestablish, revamp the PR department and allow the PR department to carry out some of these public uh, statements. Mm, very well. Uh, Honorable Obiyamwa, quickly, you wanted to react yes. earlier on, but no, 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 if I, you could I, do that I, in I, I summer. I agree with him perfectly mm. that they need a PR department or a director of communication, except that that director of communication should know his limits. Because, I mean, we used to have um, director of communications who could declare in the middle of elections that there was over voting. <laughs> when, when it comes to elections, there's only one returning officer who is the chair. So that really created a major problem for the EC. So before him, there was even a, um, Christian Osupare who was speaking for the EC. Um, it's not an easy job. Sometimes mm -hmm. they make a statement and the party is then on them. And then they have to even sit back for the chair or the members of the commission themselves to come out to speak. But I believe what the EC is doing now is just to familiarize themselves with the media. They are visiting media houses mm -hmm. just to show that we are the new people in charge and then our doors are open. You can come to us for anything you want to see. I don't think that um, they are doing it just because they want to do PR. In fact, some of us have even raised the issue that if Japasu has now been um, sent to the regions, etc., Get a good team, let them speak for you so that you sit back. Some mm -hmm. of us have also made the same comments. I mm. think it, it will help to help a subject that gets to a point where themselves will have to speak, not even the PR. Yes, at, at some point, definitely, yeah. we would need to hear yeah. from the commissioners. Uh, Mr. Friankra, your concluding so remarks. I still insist <coughs> that uh, we deal with facts. You know, you can't conjecture when it comes to facts. After the EC failed to spend their budget, <coughs> they were invited back to Parliament and they were told to put in place adequate measures to ensure that the 2019 district level elections are done according to their own proposition. And after the meeting with the Special Budget Committee, the EC wrote to the chairman of the committee, reference number C stroke EC admin 09 SF 18 stroke 90 to ring fence the unused component of the 2018 budget needed to procure the BVR kits to enable it undertake electoral area-based voters registration exercise in 2019. Further, the EC again wrote in a letter, C stroke EC 25 SF2, etc., a budget of 767 million 472.671 for the conduct of the district level elections. All these are public documents. So there is more than enough adequate budgetary allocation for them. Beyond that, you are talking about whether or not um, they've been given approval. Subsequent to that, <laughs> the Ministry of Finance issued a commencement warrant numbered B166 stroke EC 2019 com stroke zero one amounting to one o one million six hundred and four thousand nine hundred and thirty three point five six which granted the EC approval for the to commence procurement of BVR kits to undertake voters registration exercise in twenty nineteen. So these are facts verifiable. I'm saying don't just take our word for it. We have provided enough facts. We've shown you that the EC by its posturing is going to disenfranchise potentially 1.2 million Ghanaians. That's a fact. Those Ghanaians have a right to register and vote. It is not an option. The EC is mandated to designate its registration centers in a manner that is suitable and accessible. By what they are proposing now, they're going to make it very, very difficult. Even with the extra thousand um, kits that they have deployed or thousand centers that they have added, 
you still look at the way in which it's been distributed. We were not involved in that process. It was just done arbitrarily. And we still believe that a lot more people are going to go through strenuous inconveniences. And indeed, over and above all that, if you target 500,000 people, it means that your paper, your ink, everything, provision of human resource will be based on that projection of 500,000. <coughs> So what is going to happen to the 1.2 million ordinary sure. Ghanaians? Thank you. We, we need to be moving on now. But the registration was originally scheduled for the um, 7th June to 27th, I believe. Yes. But currently there's that application for injunction. Yes. So, so we are waiting that, to see yeah, what We happen. just hope, well, see how that plays out there. But we move on next to look at the Vigilantism and Related Offences Bill. And this week that issue also came up when... Uh, the minority in parliament held a press conference and uh, making a request of that president to publish the report of the Justice Emil Short Commission report, uh, which looked into the um, acts of violence that characterized the Ayawaso West Wogan constituency by elections on 31st January 2019. Government has responded through the Ministry of Information saying that, well, government will not yield to any pressure from the minority because the president has you know within six months to publish that report and so they are well within time they cannot be pressured we are discussing that issue now here on key points i'll turn to uh, mr nana abrompa here the vigilantism bill is in parliament being uh, debated the minority is raising a key issue here that well to the extent that the Justice Emil Short Committee or Commission was set up to look into, you know, these acts of violence around the Iowa West Wogan constituency by elections. It would be imperative that at least the report is considered. We see the recommendations in there and you know, on that basis we can have an informed debate in respect of the, the bill that is currently before Parliament. What do you make of it? Do you think it's justified? Uh, cool. not, uh, thank you very much. Uh, let me also state uh, CDD Code is very passionate yeah. about issues of vigilantism, uh, not because of what happened at Ayawaso, but because we'll be following uh, election related violence in general. And we actually have a data uh, from 208 2012. It's unfortunate we could not continue monitoring election related violence in 2016. Uh, we did that with Kofiana International Peace Training Center. And it was the first time, I, I, I joined CDD in 2008, the first time I was involving myself deeply in some of these uh, violent issues. And uh, it's, it's, if, if you are hearing it, as people narrate to you, it looks abstract. But when you actually experience it, then you know the issue we're discussing. I, I, when I was discussing with media as to what happened at Ayawaso, <coughs> I said that Ayawaso, uh, uh, violence it just has two differences uh, as compared to other uh, elections uh, especially by elections that we had i was at uh, was having a few ways myself and what happened there uh, the difference is that the i was always happened at a national level and therefore we have a host of media houses around and instantly we got pictures of things that were happening it's not different from uh, what some of was her assembly member was beaten. He was left there just be because the people thought he was dead. My own observer at one of the constituencies, not my observer, my own, I was deployed somebody to a community and it was remote, so he hired a motorbike to go. Uh, because the motor rider had not benefited from our training, he just started taking pictures. And he was not fortunate, he was taking pictures of these macho men and they <laughs> seeked the picture and beat him. They handed the, cam uh, the, the phone to a policeman there and instructed him to keep the phone until they instruct him to give it to the man. Wow. So when I had a distress call... And I moved, he complied with that order. How dare you, Abner? <laughs> when I had the distress call... How dare call, you not, uh, <laughs> I moved in there and when I saw them, I just <laughs> reserved all that I was going to do. It's a picture I'm painting. Sure. I met them at one polling station, you call it Mumuni Ekura or so, at Swasa Menfi, where it's in my rounds. And normally when I go there, we at, were there. you were there too. Tolo Pai, Uman no good. Yes, Uman no good, Tolo Pai, Mumuni Ekura, Ran Samra Boy. Yes. So when I go to polling station, it's your data that we need for our report. Yeah. So how many registered voters are that things? I was taken and somebody touched me like that. I turned and I saw that macho man standing there. <laughs> no, no, he wanted to find out what I was doing there. Right. But I thought he came for me. So I started shivering. 
and you know i had finished taking my data i needed to move but they had just touched we didn't say anything to me and they moved so i thought they was they were waiting for me i bet you i stood there for close to 30 minutes until i saw some <laughs> party executives moving i followed them I'm painting this picture sure. for people to understand the menace we're talking about. So uh, it's an issue that has come at the right time. I'm not saying it was good that people were molested, people were beaten at Ayawaso, but I think it brought the picture out for us to deal with it. Mm. So we need, as a country, to capitalize on this opportunity to do it and do it well. It's either now or never. Yes, the opportunity has come. Now let me come to your question. As the processes, I think we can synchronize the processes going on to make sure that we have a holistic uh, a roadmap that will deal with the issue of vigilantism. Uh, 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 I recommend, uh, I commend Parliament for extending uh, uh, the period, even though the bill was laid under certificate of emergency, yeah. but taking views from people. And could you have submitted? That's what I'm reading. Could you see if I have submitted? And I, I know NDC has submitted, NPP has submitted, other people have submitted. That is very much important so that we can shape whatever comes up to be mm, a law. very perfect legislation that can deal or at least help deal with the problem of vigilantism. Um, whether a short commission report should be released ahead of it, I think so. I think so because then, uh, even when we were developing our, our submission, we thought uh, it could have helped if we had that report so that it informs us, even though we watched the videos, we listened to some of the submissions that we made, but the full report will have helped us to uh, situate our submission into a contest so as to help. So we think uh, it, it's not only going to help us as civil society organization, the National Peace Council is also in the process right. of trying that, to yes, dialogue. Also part so of it may also help our submissions, all these things. So we think, yes, the constitutions uh, give the president six months mm -hmm. within which it should uh, release. And the constitution says that if the president thinks it could not be made public, it can also issue a statement to and say that. Reason. It's up to the president, but it's, I think it will help us in the, um, trying <coughs> to come up with a, a good inputs right. into whatever final bill we'll make if uh, the report is, is, is released. Right. And Mr. Fiyankra, so there clearly the sentiments show that it, it, it will be necessary definitely to have to have the reports, you know, considered or the recommendations that are in there considered. But the argument then is that the government or the president has within six months. So why the rush by the minority to necessarily, you know, why don't you wait, see what happens? Because the report was um, submitted to the president in March. That's about three months and six, uh, three more months to go. So then it's as if the minority is acting prematurely, even though you may have a point that, yes, it is important to the extent that this commission was set up to look into acts of violence regarding the, the by-elections. And there's a draft bill on the table looking at how we can deal with such matters. Definitely, it is an important thing. But in terms of timelines too, the president is still within time, really and truly. So why the pressure? In everything that you do, there has to be some logic, process flow. So you are not well, you go to the hospital, they give you a form to go and do an ECG and um, what's the other one? All those other ones, the one they put you in that <laughs> tube is very, very claustrophobic. And then you're waiting for the reports. In the meantime, um, another doctor examines you and says, I want to conduct surgery on you. So, yes, he starts the process for the surgery. And then the doctor that referred you to do <coughs> the test says, wait, perhaps what we are seeing could be something more insidious, or perhaps you don't even need surgery. Maybe there's some new technology that we can use. So is it not just logical? What cause, what was the cause for you going for that lab to go and do all those tests? There was a cause. Maybe you fainted, you collapsed. So let's bring it back to the context. We've had issues of violence during elections. And um, the difference in this one was that at Ayawaso West Wogan, and I'll sit here and pretend that in previous by-elections there hasn't been violence from both political mm -hmm. parties. In Gomwa West by-elections, that was one of the first by-elections, I was almost killed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It was uh, Honorable Mustafa 
who came on the scene. They, they charged on me. There was a polling station, myself and Ludwig Kronje. We were going, we heard that there was something going on and we went there. When we got there, the guys charged on me and they were coming. There were about 20 of them. And Honorable Mustafa came around and saw me. I said, my brother, this is your people. What's... And then he had to call them. Otherwise, I would have been lynched. So it is something that we have to nip in the bud once and for all. But the difference with Ayahuasca West Wagon is that for the first time, the first time, we saw people dressed, wearing <coughs> police uniforms, carrying AK-47s in all the other election-related violences. No, no issues that people could brazenly before the public in Accra. And you see, what makes it uh, even more frightening is that they knew that people will be recording them. They knew that the media will be present. They knew that it was within an urban setting. But the fact that they had the courage and the temerity and the impudence to publicly, before all of us, engage in those acts, beat up a member of parliament, say this is a dress rehearsal for 2020. Policemen were virtually trying to beg them and stop them, and they couldn't. We saw it. That was, for me, that drew a line in the sand for me. That was totally, totally unacceptable. Beyond that, they were using state equipment, SWAT vehicles. <coughs> and at the commission, we had police, national police, CID, um, 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 IGP. They don't know anything about it. So who controls all these groups that they could use state equipment, state apparatus, and engage in such unimaginable levels of violence. So that was the difference. So Ayawaso West Wagon took this thing to a different level where we could see state involvement and state sponsoring and state support of these talks and talks they are. And so if after that there's a commission and the commission has presented its report, there is nowhere that says that a president has six months. It's not anywhere. It says within, within. six months. Within six months. Mm -hmm. So, out of good way, and I've given you the analogy, mm -hmm. you want to go and do a surgery. Your lab test hasn't come. Your ECG hasn't come. Your all, you haven't done the scan, CT mm -hmm. scan and all that. The reports haven't come. And they want to take you for surgery. Does it make sense to you? So, our position is that there was a context. There was a context within which all these things happened that precipitated the uh, 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 the commission and also that led the president. The president said, one, the parties should meet. If the parties are unable to meet, he will initiate they a bill. Should, yeah. So the parties couldn't meet. I believe that it was deliberate, you know, to just um, uh, catch everybody off guard. Eventually the parties are meeting under the auspices of the Peace Council. Beyond even the publishing of the report, it will be important that the report of the Peace Council-led okay. committee should also be made public, that it will inform the bill. I mean, it should be integrated, the whole... Exactly. Yeah. So that you have... A, because at the Peace Council level, you have experts, civil society, security experts, and all those people in a very unbiased, dispassionate manner, mm. listening to all stakeholders from both sides of the political divide and doing critical analysis and bringing out long-lasting solutions. So that you have that one out, you would have the Ayawaso West commission out then that will inform the bill mm -hmm. but this bill i'm not a lawyer one but when you read through this bill you see that the bill was written in anger and you see when you do a bill <coughs> that is targeted at a specific situation and you don't look at the broader context you may be creating bigger problems for yourself because mind you and MPP people should listen. They are not going to be in power forever, <laughs> no matter what it is. Or they say, oh, they'll be in power forever. We said those foolish things. It's foolishness for anybody to think that you are going to be in power forever. It is utter <laughs> foolishness. God will make sure you are disgraced. God doesn't like pride. So with this bill, believe me, it is dangerous. They said, oh, when two or three people gather, somebody determines that these are um, uh, uh, malicious or whatever it is, they can be arrested. Do you know? <laughs> anyway. But obviously it's before Parliament. Parliament is going to do its so, job of so, you know, so, scrutinizing it, we hope. So, so and, and again, what is this about the certificate of agency? Well, it's no longer so, so, going so, through that. So, so. so they should publish the, the reports. Mm -hmm. They should also uh, let the Peace Council finish their deliberations mm -hmm. so that 
it would be rich. It would have very rich inputs from all these learned people. Then we can have a composite solution. Right. That so that, I mean, uh, in waiting for the outcome of the Peace Council processes to, that would take some time. And perhaps that would eat into the six months period, by which time the president would have, you know, published the report. But, but the president right. already has the report, you see. Yeah, but he needs to and, make a public and, 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 and issue if, a white there, paper if, there, if, so if there is goodwill, if there is genuineness and sincerity, and you have the report. The president has so many, how many thousand people working for him in Flagstaff House. He could set a team to look at it. But he still has him, within six months. Within to, six to months. And I'm so saying that, so <coughs> the, the, the reason why you went to do the lab test and the scan, you haven't gotten your <laughs> results, and you are in a hurry to go <laughs> and do surgery. Does this make sense to you? Very well. Let me move on to Honorable obi um, Thankfully, we've discussed the bill here. Mm, we did. Yeah, we went through it thoroughly, and some of us even suggested that we had our own um, amendments to make when, when Parliament resumes. Yeah. Obviously, when a bill gets to Parliament, it's not just seeing a bill, whatever it is, and say we have passed it. Mm -hmm. Sometimes at consideration stage, so many amendments may come up that yeah. you may even have to, as the Attorney General, to go and rewrite a bill. It happened several times, including even right to information bill. So I'm very confident that once the bill is in Parliament and the committee has started writing memoranda and the people are making submissions and on the floor itself we are making amendments, consideration stage, the bill will come out and all views will be taken. That's, that's the point I want to make. Number two, sometimes when we make statements, we should make statements in good faith. The 29th May statement it's not the first time NDC has asked for this short commission. Three weeks after the report was submitted, Sami DMV, in a statement, official statement, said that uh, the failure of the president to release the report would be a blatant disregard for the principles of transparency and accountability that the president swore to uphold. Three weeks. So, I mean, what they're doing is not new. Now, what they are adding is that if the president doesn't heed to their request now, that will determine whether they will participate even in considering a bill in <coughs> Parliament. Is their right? Everybody has said that, even though the president has six months, if the report could be published earlier, mm -hmm. if the white people could follow, it will assist in even this um, party mediation on vegetarianism and even the bill that we are considering. But people should not create the impression that if the president is not able to do it within the time, or he's able to meet the deadline, but it's on the last day, then the president has shown blatant disregard for the, the oath he swore. Yeah, sometimes you create there. this impression. Hold your thoughts there. We'll take a break. When we come back, we will conclude with your submission. This is the key points on TV3. We're also live on 3FM 92.7. We'll be back shortly. Welcome back. This is The Key Points. We are live on TV3, also live on 3FM 92.7 and online at 3news.com. Also on our Facebook page, TV3 Ghana. So we are now looking at the Vigilantism and Related Offences Bill 2019, which is currently before Parliament and the issues that the minority in Parliament have raised in respect of this. They are asking the President to make publish or publish their um, ML Short Commission <coughs> report so that it feeds into the debate uh, in Parliament in respect of the bill. I'll go back to Honorable Obiyama to <coughs> conclude yeah, on the yeah, The point <laughs> I was making was that if you start accusing the President of being blatant, non-transparent, um, failure to meet his constitutional duty, or because the white paper has not been published or the full report has not been published, you accuse him wrongly because he's within time to be able to release this. So if public opinion is that this will enrich what we're doing in parliament between the parties with the <coughs> Peace Council, etc., so can even the presidency tell us the stage at which we have reached in happiness we love this? And we can even come out and say that, oh, we're hoping that by this time the white people will be ready because we need to really bring out a very good work. Yeah. We make progress. But if you start accusing him of unconstitutionality, illegality, then people will say, okay, where do we determine these things? 
go to court. Go and tell the court that the person, the president, <coughs> is failing his constitutional duty. The, pre the president is non transparent, he's not accounting. These are the words you are using. So go and let the court determine that. And that doesn't help anything. Let's see how sometimes we can all agree to see how things will move forward. If it's posture, everybody has posture. Your posture is that if I descend on the president three weeks after the report, that will make him bring the report. Thankfully, as at now, your three weeks that you started descending on him hasn't worked. He's working according to the constitution. But and clearly, we, what is coming out strongly is that indeed it would be important that you know this report certainly, feeds into that. Certainly, so we hope that you. But know, don't accuse him of what he hasn't but, done. But but let's let's consider this as well. I, you do recall that when the commission was set up, one of the criticisms about the commission's terms of reference, I mean, some quite a number of people raised that, had to do with the fact that it seemed to have focused solely on events that occurred at or with, with regarding the Iowa West, mm. you know, by elections, right. as opposed to extending it to include the Triponis, yeah. the mm. uh, Itty West, and all. Yeah. I think people's concern at the time was that if you focused only on this, then it would be difficult to generalize okay. or have recommendations that would be far reaching to be able to tackle, you know, mm -hmm. a broad range of, because the vigilantism issue is not just what played out in yeah. Iowa's West. So I'm just thinking against that background of mm. that kind of argument, if we're trying to, you know, situate it within the context of this argument now mm. being made by the minority, right. which indeed, I mean, I, I agree mm. that it's, 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 it's important we mm. factor that in. I'm just thinking how much of an impact would a commission report which looked at Iowa West Wogan specifically well, we be generic enough to, you know, feed into a law that would be of general application? Well, in the first place, we need to know what is in the report. Mm. What did they capture beyond Ayawaso? But could and they have captured anything beyond Ayawaso? Well, they could have, made, they could have made recommendations. The they could have made recommendations regarding Ayawaso, but mm -hmm. it would then encompass all the other things which have happened. Because violence is violence. Illegality is illegality. They could have made those recommendations. And sometimes the irony of life the NDC first statement, they even rejected the, the <coughs> setting up of the commission. First statement, they rejected it. Second, they said they would not even appear before the commission. And then individuals, they were told, they were told oh, individuals, you can appear, but not in the name of the party. All has gone under the bridge. Now the report has been submitted. The government is working on the report in the white paper. Let's give them time, but let's also find a way of applying the right pressure so that even it comes way ahead of time. Don't let, let us get the impression that yeah. the president is acting unconstitutionally. Well. Otherwise, then the constitutional people will also wake up and yeah. say that, show me where, <laughs> let, let's then well. move on from there. Mr. Fiyaka, I'll come to you on this issue, but let me quickly come to um, uh, Nana here. Oh, you said it's, it's 10 already. Uh, no, I mean, you've, you've all more. had, I'm going round again, <laughs> <laughs> because there are several angles. There are several angles, <laughs> there are several angles, <laughs> there are several angles <laughs> this, why you want to gag him now. <laughs> <laughs> That's to say, I said all so that he wants to say. I, 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 that I'll, I'll, same question I'll, I'll turn to you. <laughs> and to, for that, for that issue, discussion, I'd want to just, you know, remind us of the terms of reference again. Mm -hmm. So A is to make a full, faithful, and impartial inquiry into the circumstances of and establish the facts leading to the events and associated violence during the Yawa So West Wogan by-election on the 31st day of January 2019. <coughs> B is to identify any person responsible for or who has been involved in the event associated in, in the event associated violence and injuries. C to inquire into any matter which the commission considers incidental or reasonably related to the causes of the events and the associated violence and injuries. And then D to submit within one month its report to the president, given reasons for its findings and recommendations, including appropriate sanctions, if any. People took issue with this. That. It's too focused. No, on this. I'm not. I, I, it, I was going to ask you to, if you had the uh, mm -hmm. terms of reference, you, you so read the C again. Um, the C says to inquire into any matter which the commission considers incidental or reasonably related 
to the causes of the events and the, the associated C, violence. Yeah. So and the you C, think the scope and the C? The C allows the commission <laughs> to look into any other related matters that are antecedent to uh, what happened at Ayawa. So related to the causes of the events. Sure, sure. So I, I always say in, in violence and elections, when you study elections, you don't always study what caused the immediate, what are the immediate causes mm -hmm. of the elections uh, of, of the violence, but you look into other possible causes that might have uh, been there, that were not resolved, that might have triggered mm -hmm. the, the current one. Mm -hmm. So the C does not limit uh, the, 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 the commission. commission. It gives it room to also look into any other in antecedents that might have contributed to the happenings of the Ayawa. So but we it, didn't see them do any fact-finding regarding sure, those sure. ones. So. They, they, they did visit. They also did uh, take papers. So we don't know what happened. Uh, in my contribution, in fact, I was I was invited to come and give submission, but I was restricted to give a specific uh, uh, submission. The, just, they just wanted to find out whether or not uh, uh, the policeman okay. at the mm. Boston Institute was beaten <laughs> by the, the men or not. That was the, their interest why mm -hmm. they called us. Yeah, so, but I think... Um, even that said, as Honorable Obi Amwa said, the recommendation is going to cover issues of vigilantism and election-related violence around, around our electoral processes. So even if it's restricted to the Ayawa by election, there may be lessons in there. And, and if there's going to be any follow-up legislation, it's not going to cover only Ayawa so, uh, we're going by election. So yeah. I think there's this prudence in there. Very well, Mr. Fianca. Still back to my, <coughs> we need the lab reports, you need the CT scan, Thank you, doctor. you need all the other reports, all the analysis to enable the doctor carry out an intelligent and meaningful surgery. Mm. Perhaps it may require that the person be, does not even require surgery, the person requires physio. Now having said that, one of the challenges we have <coughs> is that we have video evidence of people beating up people in the full glare of the public. Those gentlemen are walking around, you know, throwing their weight about. Nothing has happened to them. The release of the reports and the white paper will give an indication whether or not some actions will be taken against those people. And then it gives confidence to the public that indeed there is sincere commitment to deal with this problem. But if you have a situation where the perpetrators of these acts are being covered because there's a report that is yet to be released. And so they're going about, you want to deal with vigilante. You have <coughs> a clear or clear examples with video evidence and people came to testify at commissions. They are still, as far as I know, working within the security services. People who are two weeks training, three weeks training. And we have reason to believe that many more of such people have been recruited into the security services. So, so, the report. so these are <coughs> things that when the report comes out, mm -hmm it will be able to settle the minds of the people. Then it will also feed parliament in determining what will go into the legislation. So you have to look at um, the report uh, from the commission's report. You have to look at uh, what the Peace Council is doing, and then you put all together, and that will then feed into the bill. So I think that the, the coordination is not there. And you see, when you sit back, you, 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 you see that there's a certain in decent haste to push um, the legislation through a certificate <laughs> of agency, hmm. but then you don't see that same haste, okay, to release the report, which was the basis for which the bill was sent to Parliament. So there's a contradiction there. But that haste, so, the, 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 you see, with the release of the report, mm -hmm. there's a timeline to it. it. Let me finish, okay? So I thought you had finished. No, I haven't. So um, we know that the, the law says within six months. Mm -hmm. Now, when you do a literal yeah. interpretation mm -hmm. of that, you will say, okay, on the last day of the seventh month before 12 midnight. Mm -hmm. That would be constitutional. That would be constitutional. Mm -hmm. But that would be preposterous and ridiculous. Why? Because before there's a literal interpretation. That's using a literal interpretation. What is the spirit of so, that? Please, so, let me finish. No. I didn't, uh, please, let me, allow me. Please, allow me. Please, allow me. please, please, please respectfully. I, I allowed you, I allowed you to make your point. Please, respect the viewers, allow me. So, if you want to do a literal interpretation, why then within that spirit, did you not wait for that six months to elapse before you sent 
a, a bill to parliament which deals with virtually the same thing and at the same time you knew you are in Ghana, you know that the Peace Council is taking an initiative that Im involves broader stakeholders. So if the stakeholders come out, all these experts, they come out and some of the proposals they put out are in conflict with the bill, then what do you do? Do we go back? So there must be some logic and consistency. You don't just say the law says within this. Okay, so then let's wait. If we're going to wait 12 midnight before <laughs> that the six months elapses. Let's wait 12 midnight before the six months elapses. Publish it. Let's see what the Peace Council will do. Publish it and then bring out your bill. And then we'll have a, a discussion on the bill within the context. Mm. Otherwise, then it's neither here nor there. Speak, yeah. um, we are back to posture. <laughs> As I said, I have the white paper of the report of the Commission of um, Enquiry into our constitution, review of the constitution. The days clearly show that the government then worked within the six months allotted, even if it was the last day. Nobody said that they were doing the wrong thing. But, but he said attitude, that in the context that yes, this, this of, is of, of a certain pressing nature which led to the president granted, taking a certain action. Granted, so but don't impute <coughs> any bad <laughs> motive or any, any wrongdoing in the mm. whole thing. Don't do that. Number two, this is not the first time that NDC is doing this. In the creation of regions, the same attitude that the president should bring the report before time, otherwise they will not take part even in the discussion on the floor of parliament. The same thing. Now, I even hear that at the Peace Council meeting with the parties. This was one of the conditions. Now, if they don't see the, the report in the white paper, they don't see why they should be, be part of the meeting between NDC and MPP on vigilantism. If we adopt this attitude, you may... You may say that you have a right to have your say or to adopt this posture, but we will also then point you to the law. And if this is the way we want to go, then the positions will be entrenched. Because at every point, if you don't do this, I won't do this. Yeah. Where is your legal basis? You say, oh, the spirit of the law should guide us. <laughs> Where is your legal basis? The spirit of the law should guide us. And then you make things more protracted, and more difficult. That's my candid opinion. Very well. Now, in trying to get this whole thing integrated so that we understand how coordinated it yes. is or how it should be, I, I don't know about you, but I, I am not sure exactly what the National Peace Process, um, Peace Council process is, yes. what the roadmap is. Yes. We do know they've had some meetings, yes. but what, over what period are we looking at the parties engaging, for instance? At what point are we going to say there's, you know, it's been concluded? Yes. So that because we're trying to feed all sides, you know, into this whole box yes. or the system to make meaning, so that at the end of the day we have an uh, act uh, that is passed yeah. which is fit for purpose. And so, and Otherwise, some of, us, some of us, right from the beginning, we agreed with the president in the way he was going about it because initially the parties were reluctant to even meet, and then when they meet, decisions they take are they binding? Is it just <coughs> because they've taken those decisions, they should be carried in the spirit of what they've done? Who, who can enforce it yeah. if they don't go by it? That is how come the president said, no, then the alternative is to bring a law. Now they are peace council. We understand they've given themselves four weeks to agree on modalities for disbanding vigilante groups, etc., etc. Fine. I mean, but that, we again, should make progress. The, the, you see, the, the, the challenge believe, with such parallel systems yes, is that... Yes, I believe in the law than this thing that tomorrow it will be thrown overnight. So what are you saying? They, that that they that should put a hold on to the they NPC going process? On, they are going on. They have given themselves four weeks to bring out the modalities to disband. Because that uh, modality uh, to Mr. disband that is, doesn't have anything to do with the bill in Parliament. The bill in Parliament is saying that I want to bring a law that to make it very clear that such acts are unlawful. Mm -hmm. A, B, C, D are unlawful. Because and once they become the law, right. you comply with it or you face the consequences. Right. As to whether because of that, you the parties are meeting to discuss how they will disband it. If you do or you don't, and the law catches up with you, the law has caught up with you. Very well. Mr. Priyanka, and the reason why I'm asking about how we you know, put everything together is because Whilst the NPC process is going on, and now Honorable is indicating or disclosing that there's a certain plan to, you know, have them agree on modalities to disband. If you look at the draft <coughs> bill, vigilantism, it also has provisions for disbandment. Mm -hmm. 
over a certain period. So then you're trying to make sense out of the two processes, but it's difficult to, 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 to make that sense out of the two processes, which is, I mean, you, 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 your party is involved in the dialogues. What, what is the feedback you're getting? So the country has a big problem. Uh, we've had incidents of violence in elections and Langa. Don't forget about the Langa also. Mm -hmm. And then Bill tries to address that e as well. E exactly. So we come to Ayawa So West and then we see state actors getting involved and everybody's shocked. No, this thing cannot go on. Then we have a commission. We hear all kinds of things at the commission. We have not yet seen the reports. The same president who set up the commission that the report has been given to, who is supposed to pronounce on the commission's <coughs> report one way or the other, now also suggested that the party should meet stakeholders. So somewhere along the line, the parties also begin to meet. Then in that process, he then sends a bill to parliament under a certificate of urgency. No, he it, sent it uh, before the parties at the meeting. Yes, Whichever before, way yeah. it is. He sent it before. Uh, what, a under account. a certificate of urgency. You know, for any bill or any major reform that you're bringing into any society in a democracy stakeholder consensus is very critical stakeholder engagement is very very important <coughs> and who are the stakeholders the political parties civil society the religious bodies <coughs> etc so if you have not engaged them properly or if you are not synchronizing the activities, the activities of the Peace Council, mm -hmm. you have not released the reports that precipitated <laughs> all these things. And then you are going ahead to go and uh, under a certificate of urgency. We, passed that stage. Uh, uh, we, we haven't passed. It's still we relevant. Passage. It was brought at, as such, under, but it's it not It is true. relevant it's not because it shows you it, the yeah. mindset. It's very, it. very important. It shows you the mindset. Thankfully, that, it's no longer under a certificate of urgency. You know, it went there as It such, went but, there as yeah. such. So it raises the question as to what was the motive. Was there a genuine desire? Because what you should have done first was to ensure that the stakeholder engagement is mm. done properly. Mm. People have different perspectives. You collate all those perspectives, release the reports. Then based on that, you do a bill. I'm telling you that this bill, uh, read my lips, is a very interesting bill. But there's, there's <laughs> room for improvement. I mean, we're trusting Parliament to do very its Very interesting job. bill. And so those who are we're happy that this bill, they think they have an advantage. Just as they should bear it. in mind they won't be in power forever. Just as so as when they're doing every bill that we're doing, we should... A bill that was to be passed under Secret of Agency to one that is now being looked at critically. We hope Parliament, you know, would, would do that. I mean, we'd, we'd have about three minutes to wrap up on the show. I will just spread that out to you evenly. So, <laughs> well, Carry on, yes. Well, well, so, um, I mean, uh, it's been an interesting discussion, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, my conclusion are two. One, uh, IPAC should be looked at again, and they must review it, revamp it, and use it to sort pertinent issues on elections. Two, uh, as Ghana, as Ghanaians, we have opportunity now uh, to deal with the issue of vigilantism, and we must capitalize on the processes ongoing to make sure that we have uh, a decision that will help us to weed out the menace from our political system. Mm -hmm. Very well. Honorable? So um, <laughs> we've, we've shown why it is important that the EC does registration at the electoral area levels. Historically, anytime they've done registration at the electoral area levels, they've achieved 80 to 90 percent turnout. The first time that they did it at the district office, they had 47 percent turnout. And this process that they are adopting is going to inconvenience millions of potential registrants. And it's a right of every Ghanaian to be given the opportunity to register and vote. It's not, it's not, it's not an option for the EC. So the EC is bound by law to ensure that wherever they determine as registration centers should be suitable and accessible for Ghanaian. There are decided cases in court on these matters, and it's a matter that we are pushing because millions of Ghanaians cannot travel from their district capital, some 200 kilometers, 100 kilometers, 90 kilometers, to come to <coughs> district offices to come and register. Mm. On the vigilantism bill, I just think that there should be some coordination. <laughs> there should be coordination. It's important that the report is released it's because that was the basis for all these things mm. then we'll be able to contextualize the bill mm. otherwise the, it, it just doesn't make sense to Very me well, and then we should also look at you, what you, the uh, <coughs> peace uh, council is doing you have the last well the ec brought us a um, new list for registration centers <coughs> apart from the districts, the electoral areas they gave us a date we deserted now we understand the matter is in court mm. we are waiting on the ec 
as to whether the process will go on or the court will place an injunction on the matter. So because as a party, we are preparing, even from here, I'm going to Kofodia to train. But as it uh, is, with the application pending in court, nothing can, it, it we, operates as an injunction. Adverse. Not necessarily. Sometimes, yeah. sometimes so, you can't. That has been the posture mm, of the AC, that mm, when there's an application yeah, pending in court, adverse. then they have to be stopped. So that has consistently, so as, as, the record as, show. As I was saying, we are preparing whenever the EC is ready for us to carry on with the registration. Mm -hmm. We are ready to carry on with the registration. And then we are hoping that this will not disrupt the calendar so that it will affect the district level elections. Right. Because we are time bound by it. Ideally, it should There's have been in September. There's a referendum for the MMDCEs as well. Uh. Ideally, it should have been in September. They push it to November now, they are saying December. We are hoping this will not carry us ne into next year. Otherwise, it will be very disastrous mm. for this country. Very well. Well, so we would watch that space to see how things play out there. But thank you so much for making the date with us as usual. We do appreciate your time and the comments that you sent through. But also thanks to our panelists. Uh, we've had Honorable Osei Bunsu Amwa, MP for Equipum South Constituency, also Deputy Minister for Local Government and Rural Development. And we also had Mr. Elvis Ifriyankra, who is the Director of Elections with the National Democratic Congress. And last but not least, uh, Nana Kwabna Abrompa Mensa. He's with the CD. Ghana. On the phones, we had uh, the General Secretary of the NDC, Mr. Johnson Isidun Kitia. So we'll see you here same time next week. Do have yourselves a very, very good weekend and a productive week ahead of you. Bye-bye. <coughs>